We are absolutely delighted to be joined today by Brett McClune, who is the president and CEO of Baptist Health. Uh, there has been no industry that has been more directly affected by the pandemic than the healthcare industry. And so it'll be great to get some insights from, uh, from a healthcare system. So uh, Brett, let's, let's start off and, um, and, and could you help us uh, understand um, uh, your background and you know, how long you've been in your current position? Yeah, sure, Dave. Uh, sure, so Dave. Brett McClun, I'm the president and CEO of Baptist Health in Jacksonville, Florida. I've been in this role since July 1st of 2019. And I've been in the industry for over 30 years in a variety of roles, in a small, medium, large hospital um, CEO roles, as well as market uh, leadership roles, consulting, and a variety of other um, kind of related um, perspectives in the industry. So uh, coming into the pandemic, had over 30 years of experience in this industry, and yet uh, really nothing can completely prepare you for what we are in the process of, of, of going through right now. So um, give us a little bit of a description of how disruptive this was to all of your, your overall operations. We have some sense, but if you can give us just a little description of that, that'd be useful. Well, so there's, there's been a variety of, of publications out there over the course of the last several years about the threat of a global pandemic. Um, great authors that had as thinking kind of from a challenged framework on that this was possible. And yet there, when it, when, when it occurred for, for us, and I believe we went uh, at Baptist Health, we went on what we call our hospital incident command structure on March the 10th of 2020, that we really felt like we were starting from ground zero. Now we, we had a, um, we had an infectious disease committee that we activated in January when I read the very first um, kind of flare coming out of, uh, of China that, that there was a possibility of, uh, of, of a pandemic surfacing. Um, nevertheless, the, the infrastructure change, the logistics change, the running a, a quote unquote disaster uh, as a health organization was very different because um, this was not a, a three day hurricane or a one day fire or a two day um, freeze. I mean, this at the time, we had no idea how long it was gonna last, but we knew it was gonna be longer than several days. And it disrupted, uh, at least initially, it disrupted absolutely everything, especially as the, the local and state governments closed hospitals to, to um, you know, they, they, they call it elective procedures, but I'm talking to you know, people here that know those are really best described as schedulable procedures. They're not optional procedures. They're just things that we can put on the calendar. Um, we have the luxury of scheduling because the patient can wait. And so during the six weeks that, 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 that effectively everything was closed, uh, that was extraordinarily disruptive in absolutely every way. Oh, indeed. I mean, clearly, um, and thank you for laying out all the disruptive times we've had, uh, especially in the last year. And if you could, just building on Dave's question, you know, as you were thinking about, you know, and it became a little bit more clear that this is not a week long, this is not a month long, this is in some sense, at least taking us back to March 2020, this is a much longer uh, process. Uh, what were the kinds of changes that you were making, uh, both from a strategic point of view, and also a little bit more tactical, you know, how were you kind of making those daily decisions? Did you have an, a long-term strategy in mind as to how you will change things? Would love to hear that. So we had just really finished our, our updated strategic plan in the fall of, of 2019. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of like a cartoon cloud, we still had our five transformational themes, strategic themes kind of hanging above our head. And and we really never stopped, um, never stopped talking about those things and never stopped looking, trying to look through the smoke of the pandemic to what was next. Uh, nevertheless, as I mentioned, everything was, we were extraordinarily disruptive in every, disrupted in every way. And so to kind of bring the team back, um, we had daily, actually, we had two calls a day for a very, very long time. We increased the, um, the rapidity and frequency of our board meetings to where we were sending out weekly updates and we were doing a, a full call every other week 
in the course of all of those conversations, whether it was with the local teams, the regional teams, or the board, we still continue to talk about our strategy of how we were going to grow for the future, how we were going to integrate the system, uh, keeping the consumer at the center, elevating clinical care, and, and advancing our culture. Those were the five are our five uh, strategic themes, and we continued to, to talk about those things while we were trying to solve pro- real-world problems like where are we going to get enough PPE to put the, the right number of changes of, of personal protective equipment for each employee with the current census that we had. And uh, those were, um, at the same time, we we're innovating how to, how to make PPE last longer, how to get more PPE, paying exorbitant rates, um, 5, 10, 15, sometimes 100 times the, the regular price of, of, of PPE. The other thing that we, that we really, really had a challenge on and still do, frankly, in the industry is people. Uh, staffing became and, and is a lingering side effect of, of the pandemic is as this is difficult work. It's always been difficult work. The clinicians in health systems across the country have always been the ones running in and up the, burn, uh, the stairway in a burning building. They've always been those people. Uh, I think if there's a positive side effect from the pandemic, it's that there's better understanding of what heroes uh, what superheroes and what courage these um, these clinical staff have had always, and 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 now people will better understand that. But the pressure on workforce was the was the real that was the difficult thing to find, but simply because uh, even when when new capacity, new hospital capacity, whether it was federal or state capacity, was stood up in the middle of the well, the, the surges, the staff had to come from somewhere. And so paying staff two or three X, the going rate in what we would call a traveler's program or a, or a contract program, just move the labor from one, from one pool to another, move from the you know, East Coast to the West Coast or from the Northeast to the Southeast. Um, that was, real, was a real uh, dis- disruptive component. And the final disruptor was really was, uh, was, was the capacity itself. Uh, fortunately, where we were in, in, in Florida, uh, in Northeast Florida, we did not have the, the pressure on capacity that, that we saw in Detroit and New Jersey and New York and Los Angeles, um, and, and yet we prepared for it. So over the course of the, the first 60 days, we did stand up an additional, I'm going to say, I think it was an additional 25% capacity, like bed capacity for our system. And we only needed um, pieces of that, fortunately, thank goodness, but we were prepared for, we were prepared for the worst. You know, it, it is hard to even begin to imagine from the outside how disruptive this was uh, to you and your industry. And it, it sounds absolutely incredible. You know, uh, for most of us, uh, we were able to continue our work from home. Raghu and I both do our teaching from home. You had to actually be there on site and, and your staff certainly had to be there on site. And that makes it all the more difficult. Um, I do want to go back to one of the things that you said, which uh, warmed both Raghu and my heart, um, which is you said you kept the customers, you know, sort of as the focus. And and so clearly there was this huge influx of uh, of customers that were suffering from COVID, but you have a whole other customer base. And, um, And I'm wondering how they were affected. And, um, and how you've sort of been trying to stay connected with that other set of patients that you normally would have? It's a great question. We actually conducted our own uh, primary research in the throes of what we, you know, wave one, which we thought was, was substantial. But when we got back to look at it, wave one was very insignificant in March when we saw what we had in July and in January. Mm-hmm. But we were doing um, through through Prescani and, and others, including our own private research, kind of identifying what priorities were for the customer. Did, what did they want during this time? Did they want to access uh, health information virtually or did they still want to come in? And if they came in, how could they feel comfortable knowing that where they were waiting was 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 safely sanitized and, and clean and ready for the for the next customer. And so we listened to that data and we designed campaigns around that. We were communicating both online and on um, in in periodicals as well as we did do several TV spots um, during the pandemic that were communicating directly to our consumers saying after after we were able to open back up, but when the when the states opened 
um, allowed health systems to open back up for, for, for schedulable procedures. Uh, we were doing TV spots just so that our consumers would understand that it was, it was a safe place. I mean, we were always around germs in, in this industry and we're always cleaning uh, to make germs go away. I mean, that's, that's built into to how we're designed. So uh, we did, we can continue to des- design around what the consumer wanted up to and including, we went virtual and we about 80% of our, of our primary care and physician visits during the, during the, the second wave of the pandemic, which was right around July, were virtually done. And now that number has kind of plateaued down in the, in the lower 20s right now. But there, we discovered, I mean, the, the, the pandemic just accelerated this trend that was already happening, which was the consumer wants to access health and health care the same way that the consumer accesses everything, which is on their terms. And, uh, and this industry really does have a lot of opportunity to improve, to, to provide health and health care on the consumer's terms. No, I think, Brett, you bring up a very important point, which is also this issue that we've seen, Dave and I, when we've talked to other leaders like yourselves, is that, you know, many companies, perhaps even Baptist Health was thinking about perhaps telehealth and all of that stuff, maybe a year from now, maybe two years from now, but obviously the pandemic accelerated many of these things. Now, related to that point, you know, I'm sure you were thinking about other innovations. Were there ones that you accelerated? Were there ones that you perhaps said, maybe we should look at it? slightly at a different point in time. Are there things that you feel would be sticky a little bit more going forward? Like for example, the, the telehealth that you just mentioned has, has plateaued a little bit. Do you see that kind of be at that level or do you see that picking up back up again? Yeah, well, it's, it's funny, Raghu, that for you to ask me that question because um, I was with you in February. It was really the last thing that I did before, before the pandemic settled in and we case studied that exact question. Indeed. And um, and so we I came back with uh, we do have a, a partnership with a physician led um, um, company that was actually ahead of the curve. Uh, and, and so it, we're, we're fortunate that they had already designed their technology and they already had it out and they'd already reached out to us to partner with them. Um, on a company called Telescope Health, and that was before the pandemic, and so that was stood up and was allowed really rapid uptake for consumers to to access their physicians if they wanted to do so remotely. I do think that's sticky, Ragu. I, I do think that that will be around for a long, long time. Whether it whether it stays at the plateau level or it picks back up, I, I do think that the, the the fixed price or even the subscription model to call a physician and have a conversation like you and I are doing right now that, that culminates with some relief, whether it's pharmacologic relief or, or something else. Um, I think that's going to be around forever. I don't think that's going to ever, there'll be so many people that are saying, I'm never going to wait in the waiting room ever again. And for the, to those people, I say, fine, you, you don't have to, um, you know, we also designed, um, I kind of the iPad, like I'm on right now, we were providing those to patients in the room, uh, so that they, we would minimize the number of times our staff had to come into a room for people that we knew had COVID. Um, and you know, that's one of the challenges is knowing because early on we didn't know and the timing of the test and the accuracy of the test. I mean, so all of that, I think there's continuing to evolve rapidly. I think that's a positive and, and also a sticky innovation around how do you test uh, whether it's remotely or or even in a e- even even on site, um, we did a lot. There was a lot of innovation around um, around a PPE, both making and building and buying it, and how we did that, reusing it. All of those things, I think, are uh, are lessons learned for us. Also, how do we how do we store it, and why do we you know do we need to rely on these macro kind of distribution centers for for personal protective equipment or should health systems and um, be in that inventory business themselves? I know in California, for example, that's now law. I mean, you've got to maintain ninety days of I believe it's ninety days of of, of inventory for PPE. So all all the time, and so each of these things, I do think. Um, I really do think that the, the pandemic accelerated movement that was already going, maybe going slowly. And I think all of those things are sticky to one level, uh, one level or, or another. The, the, most, the most important thing is the connectivity, is, is how do we connect health information for patients from what happened inpatient to what happened outpatient, um, what happened in the physician office, or maybe even what happened at home. And the, the, the trends that we're seeing that are one positive trend is more and more health and healthcare is being able to be delivered at home 
Um, and that's the right thing. I mean, I think that's the right thing if you can if you can do it safely with the right technology. Uh, the other thing that's that's disconcerting and is a is a is a is a trend that also was accelerated is the need for behavioral health access, uh, intervention, information, counseling, pharmacology, all of the things that go with mental health and and, and, and awareness. And um, and we're just under uh, we're undersourced in the country for that right now, and it's a real it's a real opportunity, and it's also it's really scary to know the the, the pain that many people are in and, and just trying to get help. And I think we're on the we're still on the front side of that tidal wave as as the as the um, um, pandemic begins to subside. At least we hope that it does, and we can get the vaccine rates up high enough. And the masking rates continue long enough that it, it allows the, us to really turn the corner on it. I think that I'm optimistic, but uh, I also think that we're not there yet. So um, that's, uh, and it's very different very, uh, variably. I'm in California right now and, and, and people are wearing masks outside on, their, on the sidewalk when they're walking by themselves. Um, I work in, uh, in Northeast Florida and people aren't wearing masks in, 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 in many inside spaces. And so it just, it's variable. So, so, Brad, I was going to ask you specifically about that because I, I, I do note that you are in Florida and, and Florida uh, is a lot in the news because of its, um, its different policies towards masking um, and, um, and actually, you know, how open, uh, you know, businesses are there. Um, it is pretty clear that there is an interface between government policy and how that directly affects uh, what happens in your industry? Um, are there ways that that you and and other uh, healthcare system leaders are trying to provide input into government policy? And um, and is there something in particular that has been more or less effective on that front? Yeah, Dave, we had a call, a a monthly call set up with the local health system CEOs for a long time. I mean, it pre, predated me in Florida. So that, that, that infrastructure was already there when we got to the pandemic. And we moved those calls to weekly and um, the mayor of Jacksonville also joined us uh, on those calls. And so that we were having a regular dialogue around what was happening and what wasn't happening because there's there was there's plenty of, of misinformation out there on, on, on capacity. And, and we really stayed focused on the facts. In fact, I still have a slide that, that we have from Duval County that I share on my weekly updates with our boards that shows the, the inpatient census for the entire county and not just for, for our, our, um, our hospital system inside of that county. But that dialogue really helped, I think, in, in sharing fact and fiction with uh, or fact with, with, with local policymakers and state policymakers to some extent. Um, because we were, we were communicating regularly. The mayor was uh, um, continued to have the mask mandate in place until I believe last week. I think uh, it expired last week, uh, but, but supported us. Uh, we did many public service announcements where billboards, campaigns, you know, we did pressers, even though they were, you know, socially distant, physically distant pressers where we all had on masks and we were outside. We did press conferences to, together, again, sharing the same message of, you know, please help us help you by by following the CDC guidelines. Um, that that communication for sure went went statewide and, and federally as well. I, I communicated with all of our representatives with updates around what what was happening, what wasn't happening. And early on, we were, um, you know, as you as everybody knows, it, we were not getting the PPE that we were ordering and that we were prepared to pay for. It just was not arriving, mm -hmm. and. Um, and, and so that that led me into you know to to reaching out to our state and federal representatives and uh, and talking to the governor about it as well. And so it, it fast again it accelerated I think relationships and conversations in that space that might not have had an opportunity to happen over this period of time. And and we are all in it together. Make no mistake about it. And and I know it's it's complicated. Uh, I get it. I, I understand that you know balancing commerce and safety. Um, it that. that that's a policy decision at some point. Now, we also know that science works. And over that same period of time that we have been managing the pandemic, we've also been not managing a flu season. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, uh, while we've conducted over 23,000 flu tests um, in our hospital, we have had three positive flu patients. Masks work. 
vaccinations work. That's it, just science works. And so um, for that reason, I think being able to stay connected and sharing the facts with representatives is, is vitally important towards, uh, towards you know, moving forward on, on, on any topic, because it turns out healthcare is the number one private sector employer in the country. And the work that we do, uh, the work that our clinical teams do specifically is important you know, all the time, not just in the middle of a, of a pandemic. Right. No, I think this is wonderful to hear as well. I mean, I think the input that yourself and other leaders in the organization have had on policy, I think it's a very important one. So Brett, as we look forward, and I'm mindful of your time as well, uh, you know, as you know, you've, you yourself and other people in the healthcare industry particularly have gone through very tough times in the last year. Uh, clearly lots of heroes uh, that have clearly shown how important they are. Um, as you look forward, um, hopefully, as you said, optimistic about the vaccines coming around and so on, um, and you know, number of people getting vaccinated. What are some things that, you know, uh, a few things perhaps yourself have learned over the last year uh, that might be worthwhile kind of uh, communicating to other leaders who are, as the economy is opening up, as they are thinking about, you know, how, what good steps to take next going forward, would love to hear that. I go, you know, we're all in this together, I, I think is a theme that I'd love to see pulled into the future that, and by all, I don't, I don't just mean in the United States. I mean, the, the global economy is that when, when one part of the world is fighting with something or struggling with something, there's a, there's a good chance that that is going to change and that's going to move and that it becomes a, um, a universal issue. And, and I think this has been a universal issue. We're all uh, it doesn't matter what part of the country, what part of the world you're in. This is this is on your mind. This is on your heart, and it's where it's kind of where you start the relationship. And I, and I hope that that awareness, uh, that global awareness, continues um, post post pandemic. I think the other thing that that's that's for sure aware is that being mindful of how how your the responsibility of your actions um, impact other people's lives, whether it's their health or their livelihood, uh, that, that awareness of kind of on a micro level is also very, you know, valuable. And I'm, um, I'm not trying to get, I'm not trying to get too far afield here, but I mean, I think that theme of health is critical. And, and, and then the other, the other obvious point, I think for so many is that, is that this health, the health and healthcare is the number one private sector employer in the country. And so it, as that industry struggles, then the, the opportunity for other industries to struggle co correspondingly is something that we should anticipate from, from an economics perspective. L looking at, um, you, you know, there, there's, there will be a lingering, I think, positive halo over the industry for a period of time. I don't know how long that will last, but I hope it lasts a long time and not for business, not for health leaders per se, but for our teams and for the people that they, they go to work and they do this. I mean, they can make more money doing something else. Um, they could they could have an easier career, I think, than being uh, a nurse. And yet, nurses are heroes. And I mean, you've seen the recent uh, the recent artwork that I mean, this couldn't be more appropriate of of the child playing with the superhero nurse, kind of uh, holding it in the air with its cape flowing out. And I I think that um, you know, not to be too altruistic, but I mean, I think that that there is value there. There's value in spending time with your family and prioritizing that. There's value in, in not being so booked, even on Zooms. I mean, I think, you know, there's kind of been a, there's kind of been a peak and valley, but you know, Zoom for sure increases productivity. Um, so now that you can work 12 or 14 hours a day and not have to necessarily drive around or move, um, but to balance life and to balance health, we know that sleep is, I mean, we've learned throughout the pandemic that sleep is the, the single most important thing you can do for your health. Um, we also know that not being in the same room with family or, or friends or even work colleagues is difficult because relationships are important in healthcare and, and, and in business too. And so um, there have been a few lessons learned. I think the, the importance of innovation and in solving problems that, that we've been struggling with for a long time slowly and, and learning that, you know what, we can solve things quickly as an industry, as a country, um, at, you know, as business leaders and being open to to rapid cycle improvement and how do we test new concepts and innovate, try it, bump into a few walls and then fix it and try it again. And so 
um, I think there are some, for sure, some positive takeaways from, from the pandemic and, and um, you know, I hope we can, I hope we can make those things last longer and, and be a little stickier too. Yeah, that's great. Um, as the last question for today, and then we're going to let you go back and do the important work that you do. Um, I guess I, nobody has a crystal ball, but I'm going to ask you to sort of put your futurist view on and sort of tell us what is it we have to look forward to over the next you know, few months? Um, are we at the end of this or, or, or what? And again, you know, your, your best assessment of it, recognizing nobody's going to hold you to this. You did say this was being recorded though, Dave. So, I mean, <laughs> um, so here, here's where I am on it. And, and I read a lot and I, I'm surrounded by people way smarter um, than I am that keep me kind of up to date on, on what, what they're seeing epidemiologically speaking. Um, we're not we're not out of the woods on on this particular pandemic. Um, we're not. We we are relying on 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 mass vaccination distribution and uptake. When it when it, when it's your turn, get the vaccine. And uh, still some misinformation there around side effects and and those things. And there's still a little bit of challenge on the access to the to the vaccine. Although that is quickly resolving, which is fabulous. Uh, especially with the with the J and J um, one shot being available, so I, mean, I think what you can expect is you can expect to continue to hear people to say, "Please, when it's your turn, get the vaccine." Please, you know, continue to avoid you know close contact and you know uh, the three C's. You know, avoid being in close contact with with crowds uh, in confined spaces. Um, I think that's good advice. Continue to wear a mask because we know I mean, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that masks work. Again, twenty two thousand tests three positive flu, flu, uh, flu patients, and that's just in our market alone. Um, I think the other thing is to begin to, to imagine what the next pandemic might be. And I hate, I hate to say that, I'm really not a sky is falling person, but we know that there will be other types of things that can spread the same way that this virus spread. I mean, virus is virus. It, it's gonna always behave like a, like a virus. So um, to, to pull those lessons learned forward, and see how we can design to be prepared for whatever that next um, that next thing is. And, and again, um, I don't know when that will be. I, I do think that we will we will beat this this particular um, COVID nineteen. I do think we will beat it. I, there's no question in my mind we we will. I also think that it'll be around at a kind of a steady state it, it, that it doesn't vanish. I don't think it vanishes in the next couple of years. I really don't. I, but I don't. I also don't think that. Um, that, that we have to, we'll have to live the same kind of quarantined life that we've lived uh, as well, I think, as the vaccine and everybody will begin to get their boosters, you know, next year and so on and so forth. Um, that's what I'm, that's what I'm seeing. And the other thing I'd say that is somewhat bullish is that, you know, remember that the roaring 20s um, followed the flu of 1918. Right. Good yeah. point. Really good point. Thank you so much. And uh, for not just doing this interview, but for all the great work that you've been doing and, and to all of your staff as well. Appreciate you joining us and uh, get back to work. So thanks. My Thank privilege. You. Thanks, guys. Always good to Thank talk you. to you. Take care. Bye-bye.